Oh, I have a pet rock. <laughs> Not my cats in here, but I can show you my plants. Peter has some nice plants behind him as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. I'm actually at the car mechanic, so I can't take credit. <laughs> I just take them home with you. <laughs> they don't mind. <laughs> Oh, the coolest thing on my desk. Ooh. Oh, I missed my, that. My, it's my favorite trackball mouse. The color of Mars. Nah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Renee. Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Renee. Good evening. Good morning. Good evening. From India. <laughs> morning. Morning. What day is it? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It feels like yesterday. <laughs> Isn't it yesterday? It's the same day. Isn't it yesterday? <laughs> the only way I need to keep track of days is room. to know when to log on here. <laughs> day 25. Yeah. I know Wednesday was a year ago, so that's a... <laughs> it was. It was. Okay, I think uh, it's a, we're we're at almost sixty people already, which is great. So oh, wow, that's um, fantastic. Woo. Uh, so we'll get started. Uh, welcome everyone to eConference number two. After the the fantasticness that was eConference number one, um, wanted to try something a little earlier this morning. Uh, for more of our international uh, attendees. Um, for you on the West Coast, do we have anybody on the U.S. West Coast? The uh, Canadian West Coast. Yeah. Close yeah. enough. The yeah, West yeah. Coast. Yeah, it's currently 6.30 in the morning. So, you know, bless you all for being here. Um, wow. We have a pretty jam-packed schedule today. We have uh, two papers, a workshop, an update from the uh, ladies of Big Astronomy, which is really exciting. Um, and a few other things, but today I wanna to first introduce uh, my co-host and moderator for today. Um, I've got to drop out at 10 for uh, a, another meeting, but I'll still be like visible. Um, but Anna Green from Berlin, so Anna, you know Anna. Uh, you may know her from such events as the Pleiades National Conference wow. and possibly IPS 24. So uh, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, as, uh, as per the usual, um, if this is your first time in an e-conference uh, here, if this is if you weren't in the first one, welcome. Uh, with the, uh, the Zoom content, both with the chat, and for most of you, you're gonna have the ability to raise your hand digitally. Uh, that's how we're going to uh, queue up questions during papers and workshops. Uh, and so that way, your hand, Patty's hand just went up. Uh, it goes to the top of the list. We see that. Uh, and that way we can make sure that that uh, we're queued up correctly and we can unmute people and mute people and do things like that. Uh, so of course, the great thing I can do is to mute all of you uh, all at once, which is great. Uh, it's a complete control. Uh, so we are, it's 940. I think we're right about where we wanna be. Uh, any, any odds and ends before we begin? I know we have open forum at the end, but uh, if there's anything that really needs to get out here at 9.40, uh, feel free. Are you, are you recording this one too? Yes, we're recording and it's currently streaming to YouTube. So that link has gone up and that link of course will remain there um, as we move forward. So that's gonna be the, the process for all of them. With one exception, uh, we are not recording the hospitality suite because you know, what happens in a virtual hospitality suite stays in a virtual hospitality suite, which does remind me, uh, Mark Webb, would you like to speak a little bit to our uh, first VHS uh, tomorrow? If Mark Webb is still in the building. He's gone. Mark Webb is muted. I'm not even seeing him anymore. I, oh, am, un okay. I am unmuted there now. Go. Yes. Um, virtual hospitality suite uh, happens tomorrow at uh, eight o'clock central time. So that's uh, nine for folks on the West Coast, 
uh, or East Coast, six on the West Coast. Um, and it is just, it's like this, but it's a social get together. Um, it's just a chance for us all to connect and chat. Um, obviously, if you have 70 or 80 people uh, at once, um, there'll have to be a little bit of organization. So I'm asking people to come prepared to share, uh, bring a show and tell object or uh, some recommendations for uh, Netflix or a book or something like that, that uh, other people might find useful in uh, this time. And uh, we'll, we'll play it by ear, but uh, it's just a chance to uh, get together and um, have some conversation and camaraderie when we're all stuck at home. Um, please feel free to bring your own beverages and snacks and uh, we'll see you there. So we're getting a pretty good response uh, right now. Um, so I think we're, we're quickly approaching 50 uh, people who are definitely going and uh, about a large number of people that are maybes. So it should be a lot of fun and I hope to see you there. That's tomorrow night. Tomorrow night, tomorrow night. thanks Mark. Uh, so with that, we're gonna move right into our first um, presentation of the day. It's, a, it's an update uh, about the Big Astronomy Project. So we have uh, Shannon and Renee and Tiffany and uh, Jessica, I think is also in the room. Um, so we're gonna turn it over to the four of you. Uh, you have full screen share ability. So uh, knock yourselves out and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Big Astronomy. Oh, all right, hello everyone. Um, so uh, I guess it's gonna be hard to do this, but um, how many of you have actually heard of the Big Astronomy Project? All right, I'll scroll through. I think most of you have. Um, for those of you who have not, um, Big Astronomy, yeah! um, this is Thora, by the way. She snuck in here, so we have an extra presenter here um, who has a messy face. Um, so Big Astronomy, um, for those of you who might not know, is a project that came out of the Astronomy in Chile Educator Ambassadors Program. So this is something that this is something that takes nine astronomy educators down to Chile each year to visit the various NSF-funded telescopes, and then um, uh, we all come back uh, to do outreach to talk about why these telescopes are so important. Um, and so uh, 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 Renee and I were part of the first cohort in 2015, and then uh, Tiffany was also part of the 2018 cohort. Tiffany, am I right? I think so. Um, and so uh, anyway, um, so what, when you get a bunch of astronomy educators together, and a lot of them are planetarians, of course, everyone wants to make a planetarium show. And so that's um, one of our big goals, but we also wanted to do something a little bit more. And so we looked into the education research and our museum studies research and um, everything that's out there in terms of best practices for informal education. And we wanted to try to expand learning beyond the dome. And so we, know that people um, work well when they have choice within informal environments. If you give people choice and agency in how they learn, um, they're going to explore their personal interests and what they care about. Um, so you want to give people agency so they can explore their interests and you also want to help support identities and um, so, uh, in creating STEM identities so that people have a sense of um, they are someone who can do science, they are someone who can participate in science and support science, but also that STEM identity is something that can mesh well and integrate well with other identities that they might have. So these are sort of the three guiding design principles behind uh, what we wanted to do is agency, identity, and interest. And so we've been working on creating this dome plus model is what we're calling it. So this idea of we're centralizing the dome itself, um, but we wanted to create resources that people could then go to, so create um, an ecosystem. So this is sort of a new area of study within informal education, is creating... Hey, baby, what's that? Thanks. 
Um, so let's, so we want to create an ecosystem of, of learning essentially, or a mini version of, of something larger where people can go to the dome show, but then go out and continue their learning and um, kind of create a scaffolded environment where they have choice in how they might be able to do that. But similarly, those resources can bring them into the dome. So we can support their interests that they might have generated from the dome show to continue going out or we can generate their interest through those resources that they want to continue to learn through the environment as well. And so those are sort of the design principles on this project. It is now an NSF funded project um, in the multi-million dollar range. And so we've got a lot of really great things going on. California Academy of Sciences has created the, the show, which is called Big Astronomy, People, Places, Discovery. We have a web portal where people can access more resources. We have uh, we plan on doing live social media events, uh, which Renee is going to talk about. Um, and we also have a hands-on kit that you can receive from the Astronomy Society of the Pacific uh, that you can uh, work with your audience members and also amateur astronomers can use um, that relate directly to the show. And the show itself um, supports all of these areas and not only talking about astronomy in Chile and why it's important, but specifically focusing on the careers that people have at these observatories and the variety of careers in order to support these. So people can see a lot of different careers and identities that go into making these uh, telescopes work um, and stay functioning. Um, so we are going to be leading research and I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end, uh, but we are leading research on how all of these components do work together so we can develop um, and this Dome Plus model that would hopefully be able to work on other planetarium shows. Um, and before I turn it over to Tiffany, we did hire a postdoc to uh, do a lot of this, this research. So I'd like to introduce everyone real quick to Jessica Trex, Dr. Jessica Trex, um, who's on here. So um, if you are interested in research, you can contact us in being a site, a research site, and she's the one who you'll be talking to. So Jessica, can you say hi and introduce yourself so everyone can see you? Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jessica Turk, like Shannon said, I'm the postdoc on the project. I'm going to be the one doing site visits. Um, so hopefully, if you guys are interested, I'll be able to see you guys soon. All right. So I think Tiffany's going to take it away now with um, talking about the web portal and how you can get the show. Thank you, Shannon. That was an excellent introduction. Um, we Our website is live. Now, uh, this week, we have more than just a launch page. Uh, there's still components being, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Um, so it's not complete, but we have uh, a big chunk of our website available now. Are you guys seeing it? Yeah, I'm seeing some thumbs up, good, okay. Uh, so this is our website and um, this is going to be, we call it the web portal because we kind of think of this as like the nexus of all the different components of the project. This is um, where people will can learn and discover on their own, as Shannon was mentioning, uh, either before or after a planetarium show. Uh, perhaps this is a way to get them into your dome, but it's also a way for us to encourage our guests to learn more after a show. So right now, this is our homepage. You'll see down here, we have a little update uh, related to uh, the, the world health crisis that we're all dealing with right now. Um, originally, the big astronomy team had planned, we had all planned to do a global premiere of the show on May 2nd, 2020, that's Astronomy Day. But that's not gonna happen. It's, um, so we, we understand that things need to be flexible. Um, and this time. And so right now we're planning for September 26th. That's a fall astronomy day. We're just going to move this uh, event to that date. Um, the plan for this is that many uh, planetariums can show the show at the same time all around the world and we can have a big event. Uh, we can promote, we can gain a lot of publicity. We can get local and national media coverage. We can do a big social media campaign. Uh, we can have a fun thing to do with our local communities on Astronomy Day. Uh, so that that's our plan. I, I don't, for, to my knowledge, nothing like this has quite been done before. So we're excited to try it. Uh, so I hope you join us. We have 
over 20 planetariums that have already agreed uh, to the secondary date. Um, we had over 30 agreed to the May 2nd. So we're just trying to accommodate people as much as possible because I know it's a, it's a crazy time. Um, so more information there. And of course, you can reach out to us uh, with any specific questions regarding that. Uh, distribution itself has not changed. The show is available now. Uh, I will go to that page now. It's up here at the top. You just click Full Dome Show. And you fill out this form. This is, um, as Shannon mentioned, this is uh, an NSF-funded project. And it does have a research component, which we'll learn more about here in a moment. And um, so we do need to gather a little data. And that's where we're getting a lot of data here um, from our users. So you fill out this, you, um, you can hit send, and then it will take you to a series of links. The 2K version of the show is downloadable for free. The 4K version is um, sold on a hard drive for $400. It's shipped to you, you get to keep the hard drive. Um, and that helps us uh, provide service to all domes, 2K or 4K. Um, so. Uh, and it's also going to help us with hopefully future translations. Um, I'll go really quickly to our full dome page here. This is another page we have available. And this is showing the locations of the planetariums that are currently um, going to do the global premiere. We do have a couple of international targets. They're not on here yet, but we're looking for more. We want this to be a global premiere, not a US premiere. So uh, we'd love to have you. Um, and this, like I said, is just uh, this is just one component of the project. Uh, we will have more pieces of this website unfolding in the next couple of months. And we hope to provide some good resources for you uh, in the interim, even before September, um, that you can engage your audiences with. So Renee is going to talk a little more about that. Renee. Good morning, everyone. Um, yes, so uh, there is a lot of educational products that go with this show. Um, other than uh, the the main planetarium show, which of course we're all very excited about. And if you were at uh, Glippa 2019, um, you got to see a um, almost done version of the show and the show is, is totally done now. So uh, we hope that you are interested in showing it on September 26th and beyond. Um, but beyond the show, there's quite a few other educational products. So the main thing that um, I've been focusing on is uh, the, first of all, the educator guide, and that is done. Uh, and all, it will come, if you order the show, it will come on the hard drive if you get the 4K version of the show. Um, and it will also be on our website. So that's intended for formal educators, but it's something that you can link on your uh, website for as a resource for your teachers who will hopefully be um, coming to see the show in your dome uh, with their classes. Do you know if I share a screen, if it has to be a web page, or can I share a PDF? I don't know. You should be able to, to share any window on your okay. screen. I will try. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. I'm not going to do that because I don't know how to do it. So um, I can try to pull it up here in a moment. Uh, well, I'll keep talking. Um, so the other thing that um, the other educational product that we are working on as scheduling right now is these live social media events. And actually, we're going to be using Zoom um, to facilitate these. So this is wonderful to participate in this because I'm soon going to be fulfilling Michael's role and Anna's role that they're doing today and being the uh, administrator of events like these. So we will be having roughly um, twice a month. Um, okay, thank you, uh, Tiffany. So this is our educator guide that um, we created with the help of a wonderful graphics designer who lives in Chile. Um, but it, it just is, you've all seen educator guides, but I just uh, wanted to give you a quick peek of it that it includes, of course, information about the show, background information for um, teachers, and um, for people to read maybe before they see the show. And then it does also include some educational activities related to the learning goals of our project. Um, 
and um, other resources. There's a small flat screen clips of the show that California Academy of Science put, put together on specific topics. For example, how solar systems form, um, how astronomy is best done in multiple wavelengths, because of course uh, in Chile there's optical light telescopes as well as radio telescopes, um, as well as near infrared. Um, and it also um, has uh, oh, and other clips talking about how important teamwork is for big science and big astronomy um, and uh, how indigenous knowledge of uh, indigenous knowledge of astronomy informs other aspects of, of astronomy as um, more traditional aspects of astronomy that we are all familiar with. Um, so those are all uh, activities included in the guide. Um, and that is like I said, it will come on your hard drive and available on our website. Um, and then the live events that um, I'll be facilitating using Zoom, those are something we're really excited about. We are working with the um, education and public outreach officers of the telescope sites in Chile. Um, so the main sites featured in this show are the National Science Foundation funded sites, which are Gemini South, uh, Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory, or CTIO, and ALMA, uh, which is, of course, the radio array. Um, and so we will be working with the education and public outreach officers for um, each of those sites to have them interview one of the staff members who works at their observatories. Because as Shannon um, said, one of the main goals of this show is to help people understand how many various different jobs it takes to make big astronomy work. Most people, when they think of a big telescope, probably think of an astronomer, right? And in fact, I don't know about you guys, but in my outreach, especially with the ASEP project, um, I found that most people, the layperson, was shocked and surprised that it wasn't like an astronomer looking through an eyepiece anymore, that that's not how astronomy is done. Um, and so that's another main goal of this whole project is to help people understand that if you are interested in working in big science or big astronomy, that there is a whole suite of jobs that you can be involved with. So we will be having um, these conversations with engineers, with uh, people who work in the machine lab, who engineer, uh, who actually create the, the custom parts for the telescopes. Uh, we'll be featuring like the, the drivers who drive the ALMA um, antenna around, which is a very, specific skill set. Um, we'll be even hopefully talking with some of the people who keep the facilities running, like the chefs who work in the, um, the sites for the astronomers and other workers who stay at the telescopes. And so the goal is to get those started before the um, premiere in September. And we will be publicizing those events on our uh, for, in several ways. We have a newsletter that some of you are already subscribed to, I know, because I recognize your names. <laughs> um, and so if you are interested in subscribing to that newsletter, um, you can do so uh, from our website at the bottom of um, the website. There's a, a thing that says subscribe for show updates. Um, and so we'll be emailing people out uh, when there is a event coming up. And then we'll be using Zoom so people can participate um, by logging in just like you're doing today. But we'll also be live streaming it to Facebook Live and to YouTube Live. And so um, I do think I can share my screen enough to show you. Um, oh. I don't, I can't. I'm sorry, Tiffany. Can you help me? I need to practice this before I start Absolutely. doing this. The Facebook. <laughs> yeah, show the Facebook page. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Um, 
So uh, on our Facebook page, which if you haven't uh, followed us, we have accounts on Facebook, Instagram, and um, Twitter. And I hope that you will follow there because um, this is where we'll be also publicizing the events. And also we're um, sharing just uh, nice information that might help you if you are planning on running this show um share them with your audiences uh to help promote this show coming up so if, tiffany if you scroll down a little bit more one of the mo most popular posts that we've been doing um lately uh are these sort of mini little people um profiles like this one featuring kathy viva so um these are people, some of them are featured in the show, some of them were interviewed but um, ended up not being featured in the show for whatever reason. Um, but just a, a quick little profile on a real person who works in science. And again, showing that um, all sorts of people with all sorts of different backgrounds um, and hopefully people that your audience members can identify with because as Shannon's gonna expand upon, we all know that it's, it truly is helpful to have representation um, to see that somebody who looks like you is doing a job um, that you are interested in doing and it makes you feel like you can do it too. Um, so, okay, those are, we talked about the educator guide and the live events that will be happening starting probably in, June or eight, June, May, uh, probably in May. <laughs> I'll, I'll email you guys an updated schedule when that's more settled. Um, and then uh, finally, the last thing I want to mention is that uh, we have a, um, the educational kits that were created by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. So um, some of you, again, I know have already signed up for those. They are available first to amateur astronomy clubs, which is what the Astronomical Society of the Pacific um, specializes in. Uh, so amateur astronomers can get these, these kits of educational materials, which some of you helped us test at GLIPA 2019 again. So thank you so much for your feedback, if you provided feedback on, the, on that workshop we did. Um, but uh, they're finalized now, they're being produced now by ASP. And so they'll be sent out to different clubs around the country that they can then talk about these same learning goals with their audiences and they may or may not see the show but it's a way for us to continue teaching about these topics and maybe direct them to see the show um, in your facilities um, or the the kits are also going out to informal learning institutions like museums and so um, if you have not already requested it. We had a form that we publicized around uh, GLIPA 2019 time. And so I believe some of you are already on the list to be getting one of the kits. But if you're interested, you're welcome to reach out to us um, through our website or through our social media or just contact me or Shannon or Tiffany and we'd be happy to help uh, answer any questions that you have um, and direct you to those uh, kits. They're really cool, really uh, nice activities. Um, and ASP, they're fantastic at what they do. So I'm, I'm really impressed by these kits. I certainly would use it uh, in my institution. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because I'm involved with the project. Uh, so that's an overview of the educational products that are going along with the show. And I'm going to turn it back over to Shannon, who's going to talk more about the research that um, Michigan State University is leading on this product. Um, well, I think we just got word from Anna that we are going to have to move on to the next speaker. So I'll just say we are going to be talking about um, all of this on Friday at um, 5 p.m. Eastern with the um, Pacific Planetarium Association Zoominar. So you can head over to their website for more information and we'll go more in depth on um, the research that we're going to be doing and how we're doing that. So um, I'll put some information on if you want more information on being a research site or if you want to participate, just email me or Jessica. All right. There we go. Great. Thank, Thank you, you all, Big Astronomy. Um, looking forward to seeing what happens with that. And um, we're going to move on now to our next speaker. Um, if you do have more questions for the Big Astronomy group, um, feel free to put those in the chat or message them privately. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Stephen Bradley from um, Sunny uh, University. and. Uh, 
He is going to be speaking about tips for creating and managing student run programs in school planetariums. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let me just get my screen shared. Uh, so uh, this is all about uh, high school and uh, college planetariums who, that wish to start their own student programs and have their own student led um, kind of um, planetarium shows. Uh, a little bit of background as to who I am. Um, let's see, there it goes. Uh, my name is Stephen Bradley. I'm 21 years old and uh, I've been spending the last eight years kind of working in various planetariums, mostly in my high school and my college. I started in my high school planetarium where I ran my school astronomy club and uh, moved on through major planetariums to SUNY Oneonta, State University College at Oneonta, uh, where I created a autonomous student group over the last four years. And that's really what this program is about, what this talk is about is um, I find it very important that students get the opportunity to kind of run and lead their own independent student shows um, and kind of get that autonomy and that independence to kind of learn and prosper on their own kind of away from the professional setting of planetariums because I find it very useful. Um, so this talk is mostly gonna be based on what I've learned over the last four years in college and the difficulties and the successes that we kind of faced in our own planetarium program. It happened very naturally for us. Uh, I just kind of started doing it my freshman year. I didn't really have a budget. I didn't really have anything other than just a free Sunday every day of the week. And students kind of came on board naturally. But I do think that high schools and colleges can kind of synthesize this in a much, in a much quicker time frame than four full years. Uh, the show and the program kind of started as just every Sunday, me getting together and getting as many friends as I could into the dome and learning and, you know, teaching them about what I had done over the last four years of content. Uh, and then quickly, more and more students wanted to get involved. So it kind of became its own naturally running thing after that. Uh, and what we kind of found is that there was a method as to how to create, you know, the best programs, how to create the best content. So for people getting involved, the most important part of having a student run program is finding a leader, finding someone you can kind of hand off, you know, the uh, control and the power to, to run this program. What's important about a leader in a student led program is you need to find a student that's willing to um, kind of take responsibility for everyone else in the group that's willing to lead, that knows the system well enough, that's willing to put together programs that won't kind of let uh, deadlines fall. Uh, second, you also have to provide a space and a time for those people to kind of present and work in. This is easier in colleges than it is in high schools, as uh, in college, kids usually live on campus so they can come in whenever they need to as long as they have access. Whereas in high schools, they have to find a specific date and time via club or activity that's regulated by the school. Um, what's also important about making these groups is diversifying the students involved. I know in planetariums, uh, just making sure everyone can hear me, right? I'm not on mute. Okay, hopefully. Um, what uh, we found is that the more diverse your content is, oh. okay, good. Um, the more diverse your membership is, the more students you're running from, we tend to in planetariums grab students from physics and astronomy and kids from STEM, but grabbing students from other backgrounds, from other disciplines, things like music and art and communications and anthropology and history. When you grab those students and you bring them into the planetarium, you're not only bringing in you know, them as kids interested in astronomy, you're bringing in their backgrounds and their own perception of the world. And because of that, the content that you create becomes more diverse. So we originally started just making standard physics-based astronomy programs. But over the years, over about a year and a half, as we brought in kids from music backgrounds and science backgrounds and art backgrounds, our program became more diverse. Our content became more diverse. So on the left, you'll see one of our standard shows, which is about the Bodhi's Void followed by a music program. And then just a couple of weeks later, we're doing a meditation night. What we found is that as students were kind of conflicting on their backgrounds, they were bringing in different ideas and we were doing different content. And that really sparked a lot of more creativity in the shows and the programs we put on. 
So there was about a year and a half where we were just kind of upping the ante every single week. And we were just doing more and more creative content, trying to push what we were doing, doing shows that were more experimental than the average planetarium would put on. So we had things like Conspiracy Show Night, where we're trying to debunk and show the science behind conspiracies. And we're doing music shows and music content and live shows and, you know, shows about things that had nothing to do really with science, but kind of relating it back at the end. And it became turning, it, it turned this program in this planetarium into more of a learning center than just doing, you know, standard science-based programs. And it started with simple ideas, things like me coming in saying, you know, I want to do a music program and then four or five other students shooting different ideas as to albums we can put together and, you know, friends that they can bring in that are working on, you know, different programs, friends that they can bring in that are doing live music that can get the word out. And it was a, it was a natural progression. And the reason for that is the way we had our management structure. Uh, I found very quickly on that a flat organization worked best with students. Uh, a flat organization, for those that don't know, basically means there's one person in charge. That's the director, the, the kingpin, the, the president, the, the student that runs the whole thing. And then everyone else had equal positions. There's no interns, there's no upper management, you know, there's no vice. It's just everyone's equal. And having that allowed a kind of bullpen kind of style where ideas flowed very freely kids that were just two weeks into the you know team were able to have the same say as kids that were there for two years and kids that had very outlandish ideas were kind of given the ability to have their voice heard and we were trying to incorporate as much as we could into this program because at the end of the day we were trying to experiment being students we want to kind of push the boundaries and see what we can learn and what we can do what I also found is important, uh, especially for the person who is chosen as a leader, is providing moderate power distance. Power distance is the way in which different employees talk to each other. An example of that would be like how an intern of a company would talk to the CEO. There's a lot of power distance as opposed to how an intern would talk to another intern, which is there's little to none. Um, I found that if you have too much power distance, ideas can't be shared and kids kind of feel choked out creativity, uh, creatively. But if you have uh, too little power distance, it kind of falls apart. Us being students, we kind of lose sense of like what professionalism is when working around other students. So uh, you kind of have to find the right amount because if you have too much, no thing, nothing gets done because there's no one sharing any information. And if you have too little, then it becomes a teen hangout and then nothing gets done because kids aren't working. Uh, and also allowing independent projects, allowing kids to work on things aside from the group and let their kind of give them a space away from their own autonomous group to just work as individuals and, you know, make them feel that they have a space where they can create. Um, this was important because in the beginning, we didn't allow that. In the beginning, every member of our team worked all together on one specific project. We all worked on the weekly show and that quickly made it so students kind of didn't want to work on it. If we were working on a show that was just based on history, students from the more creative aspect of our team didn't feel like they were their needs were being met and they would leave early on so we i found it best that uh we allowed students to kind of have their own independent projects work on their own visualizations work on their own shows even if, even if they weren't presenting them in our group they were given that space to work and then they came back to the group with that information with what they've learned after working on their own um, tips to keep in mind for directors who are thinking about doing a student show and having a student program. The most important thing I could say is to have, kind of have a hands off approach. You know, allow these students to work autonomously, allow them to learn on their own, allow them to grow independently because you're supposed to be there as a safety net. You know, if you're there every single day working with them, working alongside them, dealing with every issue and solving everything for them this is no longer a student program, they're just student assistants to your program. At the end of the day, you'd be taking reins. So to allow them to work autonomously and work on their own and attack their problems as they come up, lets them kind of get the experience that they need in planetariums. Because at the end of the day, this is supposed to give kids experience and let them know whether they like planetariums or not, if this is something they want to continue. And to step in kind of gets in the way of that experience for them.
Uh, also giving it time. This is something that does not happen quickly. The first month and a half, two months, three months might go without anything good coming out. Um, it really takes time to allow these student programs to kind of prosper and flourish. I know in high school, it took three years for our astronomy program to actually get, you know, a good amount of members. And then, you know, in high school, in college, when we did our program, it took two or three years for any good content to even be made. Uh, and probably the most important thing to learn about this from the context of, you know, the director is um, failure being more important than success. So learning that, you know, this isn't about having a good show. This isn't about making good content. It's about giving kids experience and by them doing things that are experimental, by them doing things that, you know, won't work they learn what does work and they learn what doesn't work and allowing them to fail, allowing them to kind of grow in a safe space where there is low risk to the planetarium and low risk to these presenters and getting them comfortable with failure, getting them comfortable with giving bad shows, with making content that sometimes doesn't land. It helps them create better content. It helps them learn from that and, you know, allowing them to kind of fall from the nest. But with that said, I will now be looking at the chat and, uh, answering some different questions. Uh, let me bring that about, there's the chat. Okay. So are the shows free for students to attend? Yes. Um, the way we made it is shows are completely free and um, we actually had sh uh, shows come, uh, have students come in, just walk in. We didn't want to do tickets because we know that being a small university, uh, we only had 28 seats. And there, were, there was other content going in. Uh, there's public night shows, which are actually open to students and the general public of Oneonta. But because they're done through, um, I forget what the website is, but it's a, it's a website where you can get free tickets. Even though the tickets are free because you have to get them in advance, the general public tends to get all the tickets within minutes and students never even know it exists. So we have a more walk-in approach where students just walk in whenever they can you know, get to a show, we allow them to come in at any time, allow them to come out because at the end of the day, we're not here to make profit. We're here to let students, you, you see their planetarium that their tuition pays for. Um, and the age of the students, I work in a college, well, I worked in a college planetarium with the coronavirus. We uh, don't have access to our planetarium anymore. We're thinking about moving digitally, but that depends on our, uh, that depends on what software is available to us. But these are mostly college kids. In high school, we did get a lot of attendance um, because most kids tend to have, um, it's just the nature of extracurriculars. Most kids are, tend to be put to work after school. They have to work at sports or they have to do you know, mock trial. So a lot of kids like the idea of coming in on a Thursday evening after school and just learning about space. Um, and we kind of leaned into that my senior year of high school. Um, and uh, yeah, all the content is, if it's, if you want, people are wondering if it's volunteering, it is all volunteer. We were actually able to get uh, about nine student members to come in four or five days a week, just off volunteer work, just because they saw this as a, a way for, for some of them, they were teachers, they were, you know, education majors, and they saw this as them getting classroom experience without having to wait for their, uh, the end of their um, semesters to do it. Uh, and uh, a lot of them, they saw this as a way to let their creativity come out and their way of applying what they've learned. For me, I switched from physics to calm, and I saw this as a great way for me to kind of connect my communication uh, experience and what I've learned in my calm classes directly into what I want to do with astronomy. So a lot of students saw this as a great way. We did open up work study, but that was a very long and very arduous process that I had to go through with financial aid that actually no students were actually eligible for. So they actually, when they when we created this position, they made it so hard for students to actually get access to those funds, which was hard. I am seeing the word Stellarium put down. I'm actually gonna look into that. Hopefully we're gonna have a meeting this Sunday and see if we can continue our uh, Nebula Society on digitally. Um, but with that said, does anyone else have any other questions? All right, if there's no other questions for Stephen. Oh. oh, yeah, there, there are. We, um, we created programs every week. Um, so when it first started, I was doing it completely on my own my freshman year. And I would think of the idea on Monday, 
and spend Monday through Wednesday scripting it in Word and then spend Thursday and Friday visualizing it and then practicing all the way up until Sunday night. And that quickly became way too much, way too exhausting. So uh, when the group grew, we started coming in two or three times a week and one or two people would be working on scripting, one or two people would be working on visuals. We'd all come together and put it into a show at the end of the day. Um, so we were making programs every single week, just building a library of content. Um, yeah, uh, an example of topics chosen by students. Um, we did shows, uh, we mostly did shows on like specialty things in uh, planetarium. So we did a whole show on nebulas or Bodhi's void. We also did a program on, um, what was it? It was the Magellan expedition. Uh, we had a student that was interested in, uh, she was a Spanish and history uh, major. So we kind of took her two interests and placed them together. We did uh, content all about the Magellan expedition and his use of the large and small Magellanic clouds for navigation, kind of taking what these students have as their background and applying it to the universe, applying it to the, uh, you know, applying it to astronomy. Um, the music ones, we always did music shows. Um, and um, I think there was, we did also a show on the Apollo missions because a student was a history major and they wanted to learn about the cultural and anthropological, you know, background behind Apollo. So we kind of looked at different content for that. We had one more presentation in the works, which was going to be a mix between music and history, which was called Astronomy in the Jazz Age. That was all about astronomy between 1917 to 1948 and 19, sorry, 1958. And it's all about, you know, it would be talking about the major events that happened before the space race, the things that people don't hear about, but also talking about the birth and growth of jazz. And we'd be talking about it musically. So we were going to have a jazz band come in and be giving examples of what bebop and how that differs from regular bluegrass and different forms of jazz. Uh, the lengths of the shows were about an hour each. We tend to do seven to eight, so 45 minutes to an hour. And uh, I think that's the end of the questions. Okay, awesome. Uh, with that said, thank you guys for having me. And uh, it's always important to get students involved. Um, oh, uh, topics chosen. Oh, the ch topic chosen by students. Um, uh, mostly music content, mostly uh, standard astronomy shows. Most students would start out by giving 15 or 20 minute presentations on Star Talks. So one girl wanted to talk about the different forms of Orion and she gave a 10 to 20 minute speech about how different cultures looked up and saw the same collection of stars and looked at it differently. So she came from a uh, anthropology background. She wanted to talk about the cultural background behind it all. Um, but really it all depended on the students. Um, as we brought in different students, they wanted to do different things with the dome. Great, thanks Stephen. Really appreciate you um, presenting today. Um, we're going to do this Glippa style and try and be like super punctual because the, for the people uh, watching on YouTube, I want to make sure that we're on time and they're not missing anything. Um, so we have a little bit of wiggle room, but Paulette, if you want to start getting ready, um, our next presenter is going to be doing a workshop for us. Uh, Paulette Epstein from the Michigan Science Center is going to be doing a workshop on using free resources to deliver virtual content, which I think is something we all could use right now. So uh, yeah, uh, Paulette, if you wanna slowly ramp up into that, we got a couple minutes still. Aha, uh -huh. I can unmute myself, beautiful. Um, so uh, I'm just gonna start introducing myself cause this might take a while. Hi, I'm Paulette Epstein. Uh, I work at the Michigan Science Center. For those of you that, that don't know me, I am, my, my job has changed there once again. Um, I am now in charge of um, university connections as well as um, uh, like NASA connections, NOAA government connections, and um, I am uh, Right now, putting a lot of that on hold to do a lot of virtual content. Um, I'm also the theater's director there. So we have an IMAX, a planetarium, a 4D theater, a, an electricity theater, and a 
um, science stage where we do demonstrations. Um, and so right now, all of that stuff has sort of been put on hold uh, while we are trying to do some virtual content instead. Um, I'm located here in Detroit, uh, in Midtown Detroit, or I live downtown Detroit, but the Michigan Science Center is Midtown Detroit, and you can actually see um, here in my apartment, um, for those of you that saw my dog earlier, uh, she has been given a phone and she is in the bedroom. <laughs> so if anyone is wondering how to keep your dog quiet, bribe them <laughs> is probably the best rule for that one. Um, so uh, like I said, we had to take everything off site or off site. Um, we're actually not allowed in the building right now. Um, and so Monday, I spent most of my day grabbing everything that I could possibly grab out of the building um, to bring home. So I still have, you know, I've got all of my, my demonstration models. Um, these are called Celestial Buddies. We sell them in our store. They're fantastic and kids love them. So we've got the earth and the moon. Um, and I'm actually using these to do demonstrations as well. Um, but all of our stuff has been uh, taken virtually. Um, all right, so. Yeah, go ahead and start. Okay, um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, some of the programs that we're doing at the Science Center, um, just because we want to be able to share our resources. We're actually using nothing but free software. So we're using, well, paid software for some of it. Um, so we're using Zoom. Zoom can be a free platform. Um, if you are only talking to 100 people for 40 minutes, uh, you can use it uh, in that way. Um, or if you're trying to record something, you can also use it for recording. That's actually what I do. I hadn't been paying for Zoom, um, but you can bring up a Zoom meeting just for yourself and do recordings in it. And that's what I had been doing. Um, I wanna show you guys a little bit about Zoom. Um, I know some people have already figured out how to do the virtual backgrounds. Um, I don't, and some folks might not know how to do that. So um, let's see, I know like Shannon has the virtual background. It looks like Jessica does. Um, and you could actually pull up any virtual background that you want. Um, so like this is a picture that I took uh, when I was in Yellowstone. Um, here's a picture out of my window at home, <laughs> actually. Um, and so you can put up any picture, but you can also use pictures that are already there. So this is one that you'll probably see fairly often. There's Northern Lights. You can have a moving background uh, as well. So to do virtual backgrounds, uh, let's see if I can go ahead and share my screen. There we go. Um, to do these virtual backgrounds, I've actually been using, uh, can everybody see this screen that my pointer is on right now? Yes. Okay, just making sure because I can't see it. It's not coming out. Um, so when I share my, my back, uh, when I share the screen, this is sort of what the Zoom client looks like when you're inside of it. So there's the microphone, the camera, um, participants sharing your screen. So that's what I did. I clicked that and shared my screen. Um, you can also record, which is how I've been recording all of my videos that I've been doing. Um, this little thing right here next to the start video, I call it a carrot. Um, it's called different things to different people, as I've learned um, when I've been trying to explain this to people. Uh, but this little carrot right here, if you push on that carrot, it'll actually pop up with a window. You can pick your camera from that. I personally have three cameras um, set up in my apartment. My, my tablet has two cameras associated with it, and then I have a document camera as well. Um, so you can pick your camera from that, but you can also pick your virtual backgrounds, which um, is really important, um, especially if you're trying to, uh, especially if you are trying to um, pretend that you are someplace that you're not. For example, like I recorded a video last week um, and I was trying to tell people that I'm at the Science Center and I was actually at home um, sitting at my, at my kitchen table. Um, so the other thing that you can do is you can actually 
screen share other uh, content. So for example, right here, um, this is Stellarium that I have just pulled up. One of my suggestions um, for, for recording anything or doing anything like this is to have multiple monitors or multiple screens. So I do have a, another monitor set up. Um, if you don't have one at home, uh, right now it's really hard to order anything on Amazon. I ordered something and it won't be here until April 21st. Um, so uh, I know at least here in the US, places like Best Buy um, are doing uh, curbside pickup. Um, so you can order something and you can stop by and they'll just basically put it in your trunk. Um, and then, uh, or uh, a lot of TVs, you can actually hook up with the HDMI cable from your laptop or tablet or anything like that. I'm using a Surface, uh, the Surface Pro 4, I think. Um, and it's actually been able to do a lot of things um, that I wasn't expecting. So um, you can see that I have Stellarium open. The nice thing about this is that it has a cursor um, so that you can point to do specific things. So for example, um, I can point out the moon, I can point out the sun. Um, and I do suggest if you are using Stellarium or any other softwares, don't use a touchpad. It makes everything really, really, really complicated. Um, so get a mouse. I have a trackball um, that I use, um, but make sure that you've got the little scroll thing in the center so you can scroll in and out. Um, and uh, make sure that you have sort of the ability to click um, without making it super complicated. Uh, so with Stellarium, the really nice thing about it is it's just like a virtual planetarium. And that's actually what I've been calling it is my little virtual planetarium. Um, so we can move forward in time, see what's up in the nighttime sky, talk about the different, let's see, talk about the different constellations that we have. Here's all 88 constellations. Here's the art behind them. Um, we also have uh, the labels for all of them as well. Um, you can also talk about some of the things that are currently happening. So here we have some uh, meteor showers that are up in the sky. So we do have some meteor showers right now that aren't aren't some of the more prolific ones, but um, if you click on it, you get information about it um, and you're able to see uh, some of the really cool things that are happening right now. Um, you can also look at things like, right here we have the great Orion Nebula. Come on. All right, I think I have to pay, grab my Messier objects. There we go, deep sky objects. Uh, so if we wanted to look at the Great Orion Nebula, um, we can just click on it. And the really cool thing about Stellarium is you can just zoom in. Um, so I'm using the little wheel to scroll up um, and scroll in on the objects that I'm looking at. So right here, we've got the Great Orion Nebula, um, and we're able to see a really great image. Uh, another um, another resource that I've been thinking about using is Worldwide Telescope. Um, and I know um, that there's been a couple of videos about Worldwide Telescope uh, already uploaded to uh, our Dome Dialogues page, which is fantastic. Um, and we also have, let's see what else is going on. Um, so, so that is really, really fantastic that we've already got those uh, dome dialogues for Worldwide Telescope. Uh, there's some other free softwares out there like OpenSpace. Uh, I've been thinking about using OpenSpace uh, for that, um, but I, uh, but I uh, haven't really gotten a chance to do it yet because I'm pretty new to OpenSpace. Um, but like for v for example, Venus right now, really, really bright in the sky. Um, and when you scroll into Venus and keep going, it'll actually start to show the phase that Venus is in right now. So um, one of the reasons I really, really love Stellarium uh, is because of its sort of ease of use. Um, and you can even encourage people to use Stellarium at home because it is one of those free softwares. 
Uh, some of the other things that we're doing, um, you might have, if you are friends with me on Facebook, you might have seen that I've been posting a lot of live videos that we're doing. So we're streaming all of this. Um, we're streaming once a day at 2.30 uh, to Facebook Live. Um, and actually what we're doing is we're using the Zoom platform to do that. Um, so we're using Zoom and the webinar package for that. So that's a that's we're actually paying for that specifically. Um, so the we're using that Zoom platform um, to to send everything out to Facebook Live, just like we're doing to YouTube here um, through Dome Dialogues. Um, so one of the things that we're planning on doing is a virtual planetarium show. So. Um, Basically, our correspondent that is that is at our distance learning studio, which is actually now moved to her basement, uh, will be um, throwing it off to me, and will uh, I'll be able to go through everything that we have up in the nighttime sky, talking about um, the winter circle right now, talking about my favorite little constellation right here, Canis Minor, the little dog. Um, I have a feeling that the hot dog joke won't hit quite as well as it does in the planetarium, but one can help uh, when we actually start doing that one. Um, so for those of you that don't know the hot dog joke, I'm sharing this with everybody. I see Anna rolling her eyes at me. <laughs> um, but, that was uh, not an eye roll. <laughs> So um, Procia, or, uh, the little dog right here, the only dog that I see in that part of the sky is a hot dog. Sorry, mustered up the courage to tell that one. I really thought you'd relish the joke. Okay, all right, I'll let everybody catch up. Um, so uh, hopefully I'll be able to do that joke and it will still hit at least a little bit. Um, so uh, another thing that I have purchased is uh, a document camera. Um, and with this document camera, it's been really nice because uh, I can actually show some of the hands-on activities that we plan on doing. Um, so like I said, I, I sort of um, raided the supply closet and just grabbed as much stuff as I possibly could to bring home um, so that we can continue to do some of these activities. So if I stop, oop, oop, oop. That's not what I meant to do. Stop share, there we go. Um, and let's see. Uh, and if I actually change my camera, so using that little carrot that uh, I was pointing out, I can change to my other camera. And of course I'll have to get rid of my virtual background for this. Um, you can see that I have something set up right here. So in here I've got sand um, and then on top of this, I have um, iron filings. Um, so you guys might have used the um, meteor activity in the classroom where you use flour and then you cover it with, um, with cocoa powder. Um, but this is a, uh, this is a different activity, um, a little bit. So these are actually iron filings because we have a magnet right here. So we can actually separate this out when we're done. Um, for those of you that haven't uh, checked out the NiceNet activities, uh, they're really super fantastic. Um, I'm going to give them a shout out. This is one of their activities. So we have different uh, objects here. We've got some rocks that we literally just pulled from outside. Sorry, it's mirrored, so it's a little bit weird to, to show things. Um, we've got some smaller marbles, some larger marbles, um, and we're able to talk about um, meteors, or we're we're talk, we're able to talk about sorry craters um, as we drop these craters sort of in the container. There we go. Um, so we're able to talk about the ejecta, um, the walls, all of that stuff using the document camera, um, and it's it's actually been really nice to be able to set up. Um, the uh, document camera was like 20 bucks on Amazon. Um, so it's not a great document camera, but it gets the job done. Um, and so it's been, we've, we've actually started recording hands-on activities to be able to post onto our website. So the Michigan Science Center is uh, doing a lot of 
thank you, Dana, uh, doing a lot of really cool things um, so that we can uh, interact with our audience. I know Detroit is a pretty hard hit area, um, especially because we have a lot of folks that they can't even afford food right now. So, um, so I am going to answer a couple of questions that have come up. Oh, April. <laughs> I love, I love that. I'm, I, that might be, uh, that might be en ending up in my joke. It's just the worst. Um, let's see. Um, so do you know if you can add animations to Stellarium? Um, that's from Julie. That's a really, really good question. Um, I'm not sure if you can add, uh, I don't think you can add animations to Stellarium, but that's where some of the other softwares come in. So like Worldwide Telescope, um, if you go and you look at the videos that I think Dave dated is his name, posted on Dome Dialogues, uh, definitely check those out because um, he is like a pro with Worldwide Telescope. Um, you can also use, like I said, um, you can also show just videos. So for example, if you create an animation, um, you can show that through, like if you have your, your video player, your media player. Um, the last program that I did, I had a, uh, I had a PowerPoint basically in the background and you can show that PowerPoint as well. Um, so you can show any animations that you wanna add into from there. Um, I'm gonna mention Alt-Tab is your best friend when it comes to these virtual interactions. Because right now you're looking at me, you can't see when I do alt tab. Um, if I share my screen again, uh, let's see, if I share my screen with Stellarium, you can see the, that Stellarium is back up. But if I do alt tab and I change, what is on that screen, you can't see it in the background. So let's see, something that I can share. <laughs> um, so uh, the other really nice thing about uh, Zoom is right now, you're still probably looking at Stellarium, correct? Yeah. Everybody's still looking at Stellarium. Um, so if I do a new share, um, and instead of showing just the Stellarium, I show my screen too. Now you can see, there we go. Now you can see actually what's on that specific monitor. So you can either show different windows um, within it or you can show the different monitors. Um, so like I said, uh, definitely suggest two, at least two monitors. Sometimes I think that's not even enough. <laughs> um, but uh, so there we go, I close it again and I'm back to Stellarium. Um, let's see, I have, uh, thank you, Dario, the enter and space to follow center before zooming. That's really, that's really super helpful, um, for everybody. I didn't even know that. Um, I'm still getting to know some of these programs myself as I'm, as I'm doing uh, the virtual programs with our guests. Um, let's see, if you record yourself on Zoom, do people have access to Zoom to see it? Um, so when you record yourself on Zoom, you end up with a little video that uh, ends up on your hard drive. So you can either do one of two things. You could, um, you could, record it and drop it onto your hard drive, or you can cast it. Um, if you cast it, that's when you have to spend money to, to do that. Um, but like the little five minute video that I did, I just recorded it, sent it to our social media people and they posted it on the Facebook page. It does record it in MP4 format. Um, and I'm not sure if it if it's possible to change the format. I haven't really played much around with that, um, but uh, I love seeing all the animals in the <laughs> In, in the little Zoom chats. Uh, but that's that's how I've been doing it, at least, has been recording myself and then posting it online after the fact in that MP4 format. Um, but uh, like I said, with the Michigan Science Center, we're also doing that, that casting option. Um, but that's the one that 
that the Science Center is paying for, not my personal account, because <laughs> it is a little expensive to do that. Um, and having the, uh, let's see, oh, which which document camera that did I get? Uh, it's a really good question. Uh, I don't remember what it's called. Um, I think I still have the box here. Let me take a look. Also, Bluetooth headphones are fantastic. <laughs> As I walk across the room, I can still talk to everybody. Uh, it's an all-in learning uh, document camera. It was really inexpensive. It does have a focus in it. Um, so you can do either the manual focus, it also has an auto focus uh, as well. Um, I haven't really played around with it too much yet because I haven't recorded anything. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, Waylena said she's been uh, able to use her iPhone as a document camera using a selfie stick. That is a really great idea. Um, and uh, it's something that I would really like to try. Um, Yes, uh, so John Forsh mentioned that you could use OBS uh, to composite your stream. So OBS is another software um, where you can like have different windows, you can have a whole bunch of different things. Um, I started to play around with it um, and I am interested in using it for some of my recordings, um, but it is a, um, it is a little more complicated to try and figure out. Um, and because most of us are already using Zoom, um, it's a really great way for us to get to know Zoom, but OBS uh, is pretty fantastic. I was playing around with that the other day. Um, it does not do the virtual background unless you have a physical green screen. Um, that's the other reason why I'm not using it uh, because I like the ability to do that virtual background. But virtual backgrounds work really, really well if you have a a, a contrasting background. Um, so if you're wearing a blue shirt and you have a blue background, then it's not going to contrast very well. Um, we, we actually use it at the Science Center and there was one video, I had to change my shirt because it matched exactly the color of the wall behind me. Um, and so we weren't able to use our green screen method. Um, from there. Uh, you can do green screen in Zoom as well. So when you pull up the uh, video settings, you can set it to having um, a green screen. You can also set it to touch up your appearances. Um, so if you're like me and you didn't feel like putting makeup on this morning, um, you can have it touch up your appearances so your, your nice giant acne disappears when <laughs> you're chatting with a whole bunch of people. Um, and uh, so that is a really great thing to be able to look through as well. Definitely look through all of the different settings in Zoom because you can do a lot of really fantastic things. Um, <laughs> Renee, I, I love this edition. Practice first. Um, the, the first video took me about uh, 10 takes, um, mostly because half of them, there was a dog barking in them. <laughs> Um, I live in an apartment building um, here in Detroit, and so anytime somebody walks in the hallway, uh, she's going to bark at them and try to protect me, which I appreciate, um, but it gets a little annoying sometimes. Yep, so I hear, I see some people uh, that you can, that you're already using um, OBS. Like I said, the video format is MP4 that comes directly. Uh, yep, blue screen works really well. Anything that you can key to um, is, is a really great way uh, to put something up. So uh, there's actually one of my staff members created a tutorial on how to hang a sheet on the wall behind you. Um, unfortunately, my apartment is so small, I don't have any blank walls uh, to be able to do that. Uh, I, have a, I have a little 550 square foot apartment <laughs> here in Detroit, so um, I don't have any, any blank walls to hang up a curtain to be able to record anything. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Oh, wait, that's fantastic. You used a tea towel on your chair. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, um, yes, bright green poster board. Yeah, some 
some really great suggestions coming up in the in the group chat as well. Um, like I said, I don't I don't have a place to put a green screen unless I actually like purchase one of the green screens. Um, and again, Amazon right now is super far behind, so I'm not sure where else I could get something like that. Uh, I actually um, was, like I said, um, trying to to get a couple of things and it's not getting delivered until like April 21st um, because everything is just so far behind unless it's essential. Um, another suggestion that somebody suggested to me, um, but I'm probably not gonna follow uh, is um, if you are doing anything with the document camera, make sure that your hands are clean, your nails are clean, all of that stuff, because that can show up on the document camera as well. Um, somebody had suggested to paint my nails, um, and I said, oh, you don't know me very well. Uh, <laughs> that, that nail polish will chip in approximately 20 minutes. Um, and so that's that's not an option for me. That's something that I have, have thought about. It's just making sure that your hands are clean, your, your nails are clean. Um, because it does show up on the document camera when you're doing activities. Um, <laughs> nail polish, cat fur does not go together. Um, let's see. Um, any other little tips and tricks? Um, I'm glad I'm not the only one who's who cannot wear nail polish. <laughs> um, Let's see, like is there any other tips and tricks that we have? Um, does anybody have any other questions that haven't come up in the chat uh, already? Um, like I said, oh, like I said, practice, practice, practice. Um, before you record your final video. Uh, the nice thing about Zoom also is that when you do hit record, the, um, when you do hit record and you stop the recording um, it, and then start a new recording, it does create a, it does create a separate video. So you can have the same Zoom meeting and if you screw up and you need to stop the recording, you don't have to stop the meeting and have everything compile. Um, it will it will automatically do that for you uh, and create separate different videos. Like I said, I think one of them I had like eight different videos because I was interrupted a couple of times, screwed something up a couple of times. Um, and like I said, it does really take a lot of practice that like so that you don't look like you're stumbling over the transitions from one thing to the next. Um, Alt-Tab is your best friend. Um, sharing a screen, use more than one monitor. If you have access to more than one camera, um, it's, it's really nice to be able to switch back and forth. Um, for those of you that are so inclined and aren't willing or don't wanna try using Zoom, try OBS. Uh, it is really fantastic. Uh, the touch up appearances button is under that same um, carrot next to the video. Uh, and it is under video settings. So under my video, you can touch up appearances. Um, I'm not going to get rid of it because like I said, I didn't put up put makeup on this morning. Didn't feel like it. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it is pretty great. And uh, Marco has a really great suggestion. Having a dedicated spot at home or in the office with proper lighting, background, all of that um, is, is really fantastic. So all of the programming that we're doing live um, is actually getting um, sent out of one of my colleagues' basements. So she has a whole big setup down there with a green screen, a table, multiple cameras, multiple microphones, all of that. Um, for those of us who are just doing like these short recordings, uh, it is really important to create that quality standard. Um, but luckily with the recordings, we can try again. <laughs> if, like I said, the dog barks in the background or uh, a fire truck goes by, because that happens fairly often in my apartment as well, so. All right, any other questions, comments, things you want to add? Okay, well, thank you, Paulette. Appreciate that. And hopefully that helped a lot of you to um, feel more confident in 
bringing your planetariums to your visitors at home. A um, couple minutes before the next presentation starts, it's going to be um, a paper on Mahatma Gandhi's writings on astronomy by Nandavada, I'm so sorry if I mispronounce your name, Khatnastri uh, from the Nehru Planetarium. Um, and uh, if you want to get started setting up and maybe just do a couple minute introduction and then uh, we'll get started with that in a minute. Hello. Should I start? Yeah, yeah. That's what she's saying. And I muted myself. Uh, go ahead, go ahead and introduce yourself and, and roll yeah. on into yeah. Good morning and afternoon, evening to everyone. And um, I'm really grateful for this possibility of our being together in these difficult times. And um, I, I really enjoyed listening to all the content which was shared. Uh, I just want to know whether uh, my connection is sufficient uh, for, for my upload. Is it coming okay? We can hear yes. you. Oh, yeah. thank you, thank you. Uh, I, I, I really enjoyed listening to everyone and there are so many possibilities of um, content which is shared in all of these and I will be following these up. And uh, I am talking about a slightly different topic perhaps, but even this is in the context of sharing of resources. Uh, this is something perhaps a little niche content because this is um, about, um, it's something unique. This is a planetarium show which was created, which I created in our planetarium, a full dome show. And this um, show, in fact, we have called it uh, Bapu Ki Khagol Potli. This planetarium script is called Bapu Ki Khagol Potli. Uh, I hope there was no disturbance in this. This planetarium script is called Bapu Ki Khagol Potli. This is about Mahatma Gandhi's interest in astronomy, which we try to share with the young people who come to the planetarium, young and all ages, people who come to the planetarium. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi, father of the nation for us here in India, we call him Bapu. So Bapu Ki Khagol Potli refers to, Khagol is astronomy. Potli is a kind of a bundle. So Bapu ki Khagol Potli means Gandhiji's bundle of goodies in astronomy. So that was the title of this planetarium show, which um, I created for our planetarium. It's about 20 minutes. And I would be very keen to share this with anyone who would be interested in this, the script, as well as the audio for it, as well as some photographs of Gandhiji, which could go in for this script. And uh, the unique thing about this planetarium show is that the script writer for this planetarium show is a historical personality, Mahatma Gandhi. It's very little known, perhaps hardly known, that Gandhiji, who in some sense, he, he gave, uh, he was instrumental in achieving freedom for India. And he's seen in terms of his contributions to the building of our nation. But uh, his interest in astronomy is something which is, he's also seen as someone perhaps not so very, uh, very much for science. Because he has, he has talked about science without humanity, the problems in that. So he's been seen somewhat as anti-science. Whereas when I came across many of his letters where he has talked of astronomy, he has shared with several people. Any one day he would write several letters. And I would find that at that time when he had this tremendous interest in astronomy, so every letter he writes, he's talking a little bit about this, his interest in astronomy. He first starts talking about how it 
gives gave him a sense of peace it gives him a feeling of being being connected with god and so a number of these descriptions which he wrote in letters are those but he also talks about um, uh the 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 simple sky itself he talks he writes letters to children and in that he tells them that look uh, many newspapers and magazines give um, sky maps and he asks them to use these sky maps and uh, get to know the sky he writes sometimes i am i'm observing he he's right this was his interest developed when he was a political prisoner in 1930s and he talks about how he was a prisoner at that time uh, with two other people and he talks of how all three of them would be sleeping outdoors and he talks of various things he sees in the sky and uh, in the show for instance we have talked about the show these so it really gives in a way when he is saying talking about how i'm sleeping outdoors and we see leo overhead we see jupiter at that time and after looking up these dates i put it up in stellarium and we see these the exact uh, description that he has given so it really gives goosebumps to some extent and so there are several such references which have gone in into this planetarium uh, show and uh, although this this there is one other incidents which happened it's unfortunately is not included in this version of our show i hope to update that later there is an instance when uh, he was addressing a large gathering of people and he was expressing his concern about things happening at that time in india and he talks of how um, india is eclipsed by the british empire and he is he several times uses similes in astronomical context so he is talking about this just like the moon is in eclipse now he says and that our country is under eclipse and i looked up the date and it was exactly a time when an eclipse was taking place and typically when there's a lunar eclipse in india people there's the large gathering of pilgrims observing the eclipse so this was happening at such a pilig pilgrim gathering where he was addressing people and there was a lunar eclipse happening at that time so once again when one is these were all have uh, uh, not been kind of noticed because his interest in astronomy has kind of gone so much in the background not something as because his contributions are so very large in another area so this is a neglected area so looking at all of these and putting um he for instance he yeah so here uh, he he sketched to to children when he is writing letters he made sketches of uh, big dipper and um, asa major asa minor orion etc etc and these have been kind of fitted uh, on to maps and um, uh, it's uh, it is once again very very interesting to see how just he is sitting in prison writing to children and drawing these maps by hand is observing the sky and uh, he has got these uh, views um quite well with some errors but quite a quite a lot of uh, accuracy in that but accuracy is not the part of it it is just that uh his voice being something which everyone would have had followed so uh the content that he sharing with children as an educator he for instance talks about how the role of the mother in educating the child he wanted to bring that back he says this had a lot of um, i mean this this was there in the beginning and it is going in his times and he wanted to bring it back and he writes small primers for educators where a mother is talking to children and talking about the sky and so the children are asking her various um, uh, parts of it and is she is answering them and so like this he has given primers also to educators and where uh, one of the things he says that children are taught astronomy sitting inside classrooms looking up textbooks and um, uh, he says that the way children should be taught astronomy is take them out and let them sit under the stars and get to know the stars and so this this was his uh, kind of nudge to educators so taking all of this up, we uh, conducted for a whole year we conducted a series of programs in several locations which were visited by gandhi ji and we conducted telescope sky watches at night or in uh, activities and with hands on measurements where students would be able to measure 
maybe the angular diameter of the sun and so on and we talked to them how they could do the same and there was an eclipse make angular diameter measurements of the sun and the moon during the eclipse by using simple projection setups and so on so in a sense inspired by this nudge that he was giving to educators to make astronomy hands on and his interest was certainly something which was there perhaps all through though it became intense at some specific periods so there is a particular uh, example which uh, is very very illustrative he this is early in 1922 but at, at the time when his interest in astronomy was not so much at, the, at such a peak but many times when he is not uh, when he is not actively involved in astronomy meaning uh, reading about he not only did sky observations himself he read a lot of textbooks on astronomy too so many of his concepts i mean concepts that he tries to convey to children are definitely something where he has got a good grip and he is trying to convey the same to children and um, but at other times what i found was that when he was not actively involved in it but it was there in the background it would come out many times in the way that he would use similes and metaphors from astronomy so uh, like for instance when the eclipse were ecle eclipse thing at the pilgrimage and he's also talking about uh, at one point he says that look at the infinite number of animals countless millions and millions of insects and so on microbes and he says that who are we to set a limit to god's sphere of action and then he says are there not countless other suns and planets in this universe so this was in 1922 in an interview to manchester guardian and there was another time when he wrote an article in a magazine which he himself was editing young uh, opinion and in that he has written about san francisco just past the earthquake and he is appreciating the way the city has got back together and, uh, and so the entire article is about that at one point he says they are also trying to communicate with perhaps other um, civilizations in other star planets so these are, i mean his his outlook back in 1920s and 30s was very very modern and there is a there is a, a point where um, he has he was reading a textbook on astronomy and a, this was actually a textbook by annie monder and he is telling his uh, secretary um, mahadev desai that uh, this author has given a very good definition of science and mahadev desai says that gandhi ji was so inspired by this he was following it up in his day to day activities itself and uh, the definition which uh, which um, so inspired gandhi ji was that science is accurate measurement that was one statement which he took from the textbook science is accurate measurement and using this again as a kind of a slogan for our um, activities related to gandhi ji's interest in astronomy so uh, wherever we have been doing uh, these um, yeah this is this is the one where uh, uh, i hope uh, i i have not been using uh, screen sharing because i'm using a phone so i just have it behind me i hope it's not mirror inverted it's visible but uh, so th this uh, aspect that he not only was a sky gazer not only did he ask children to do sky gazing but he read any textbooks that he could get hold of he used to write to many people asking him to send him books on astronomy and he digested quite a lot of it and so because many a time uh, one comes across statements from him which reflect that he had got the uh, gist of the like when he when when he talks of all the constellations and he gives all the mythologies both indian as well as western mythologies to children when he is writing at the end of it he says all of these are beautiful fancies but all these stars are nothing but millions of millions of suns far away and because they are so far away they are like points of light and all of this and he also many a time even when he is using these as similes and metaphors the the science aspect of it he he has a grip on that and uh i was trying to yeah so um, many a time he is uh, he's is addressing young people asking them to be disciplined and then he says um the way 
all these celestial motions are happening the way all these celestial bodies are sending out light to us all of this is an example of discipline and if none of if this discipline wasn't there in nature then there would be utter chaos and so on so in many ways many times it happens that we get these glimpses of his interest in astronomy given that he is bapu mahatma gandhi so it it is not that he is an astronomer not even that he was an astronomy educator but that he has an interest in astronomy become something which is of of such deep interest to us as astronomers and particularly us from india and if there would be any interest in uh, share, uh, using this script or any modification of it uh, the script is here uh, i'd just like to show a few glimpses so the way the script was written uh, no, the scale, the way the script was put together was to take only gandhi ji's writings the script doesn't have anything from uh, from my side so it just picks up his writings from various contexts and then i just put them back and forth to make a kind of a flow so and the flow should be a little bit have the grammar of a planetarium show so that is how these were put together so to begin with there are statements where he is talking about how sky inspires him how stars inspire him and later on he talks about how uh, these um, he's talking to children telling them where so i have a few uh, one one photograph of gandhi ji where he is kind of on a deck chair and is pointing out something this was in a different context but that particular photograph we put in the dome we have the stars so it really feels as if gandhi ji is pointing out stars to the children so all in all this has a very special kind of a uh, feel particularly for anyone in india who would come and see the see this if there is any interest we would i would be very happy that uh, we would perhaps have to get it processed through our head office but we we would be very happy to share the script and the photographs and the recorded audio for it the recorded audio of course uses a lot of the, his favorite music and also there was one time where if if i am running out of my time please let me know uh, i just wanted to uh, mention one one other there was a time when he badly wanted that somebody should make an art work where he used the simile his favorite uh, kind of a symbol as well as uh, tool was the chetka hand spun cloth the chetka uh, to spin uh, uh, thread cotton threads and he was also very passionate uh, about village industries being sustained and not going on towards industrialization so he would talk about he said that the chetka is like the sun of a solar system and all other village industries are dependent on it and for many for many of these um, cherka sang meetings he wanted someone to draw a kind of a, a visualization which would look which would have the cherka at the center in the planets being the village industries and so we use this as our kind of main logo when we did this year long uh, this is 150 years gandhi sesquicentenary and that is why this was uh, this particular celebration was done so this is there are of course several other uh, examples i i was also hoping to perhaps submit this to maybe the planetarium at some time however when i had initially done this i didn't have that many interesting references with me from gandhi ji's writing so i find now that i have many more interesting references which have not which are not been included although the script does have he talks of um, the pole star and the asa major asa minor looking at those trying to get an idea of time he in fact there was a uh, of uh, for uh, direction also there was a time when he writes to his secretary saying that i was going alone in a car i was traveling somewhere and i felt that i had lost my way got down looked at the stars and then turned back and came to the correct direction and so on and so there are any number of such uh, uh, references which uh, about on astronomy which gandhi ji had um if if i have not run out of my time perhaps i could go through at least just one other have i is have i a couple of minutes more um you have two minutes left yeah so i i just just I just wanted to mention that at one point he is uh, he is right there was uh, one uh, uh, fellow freedom fighter with him kaka kalinkar who was an amateur astronomer who in fact gave this uh, interest in astronomy to gandhi ji 
And at one time he's writing from the prison that these are the things I'm seeing in the sky. And just when my interest in astronomy got so intense, he, Kaka Kalelkar was released from prison at that time. And he writes to him saying that I'm expecting a big telescope to come for me to observe the sky. And in fact, uh, there was one lady, um, uh, Pamela Thakarse, who actually sent her telescope to the prison for Gandhiji to observe the skies. He was initially not allowed, but after several requests, it was allowed to come into the prison. And uh, there was a time when several uh, newspaper people came into the prison and they saw these two big telescopes in the prison compound. And uh, Gandhiji then talks to them about how observing the skies inspires him so much. And he writes to several people about his usage of the telescope how he has seen Jupiter through it. And he's also seen, uh, he, no, he's not seen. He had heard about a nebula, which he calls Parija, but we don't know exactly which one. Perhaps it was Orion Nebula. It would have been something which would have been easily observable through a small amateur telescope. So he had heard of such a nebula. And he says that I tried very hard to view this through the telescope, but that he had not been able to do. But he also tells, when he's talking to the uh, newspaper reporters, he says that, about the telescope, that how uh, these uh, the the usage of it, it's delicate. But he says that he has been able to master it. So in in that, that in that sense, he it seems that he was always hands on with his experiments with truth. Thank you. Thank you so much for presenting. That was great. Um, and I'm seeing in the chat. Um, that people are asking for copies of the script and um, for you to submit it to the planetarian as well. Um, yes, yes, I, 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 I will share a copy of the script in uh, on in the Dome dialogues. Can if I share that, will it be okay? There, that would be great. I will do that. And also, I may update it because I have many more new references. So that too, I would I would share that. And um, uh, also, if any photographs, etc., if people would be interested, I would. Yeah, please. I think maybe there are more questions. Um, I'm not seeing any pop up at the moment. Um, and we do need to move on to the next session. Um, but we'll have some time at the end too. So if anybody's thought of any questions for any of the presenters today, when we get to the um, kind of open talking period, uh, we can definitely um, get back into that. So um, next, uh, we are going to be uh, discussing upcoming streaming event announcements. Um, so if any of you are planning on streaming anything in the near future um, that you would like to um, shamelessly promote, now would be the time to do that. We would love to hear about it. And uh, also do make sure you, you um, Put it on Dome Dialogues as well so we can have a, a link there. You may unmute yourselves. Um, the Peoria Riverfront Museum, uh, my museum and planetarium is has launched like many museums, a virtual museum effort. Uh, so we have something new on our social media pages pretty much every day. And we also have a, a Dome Planetarium page uh, specific to the planetarium. And we actually, before this happened, I'm really glad we started it before this happened. Um, we had started doing just short little quick videos explaining things that you can see in the sky or uh, science events. So uh, those are being posted on the Dome Planetarium page. Uh, so both live and recorded videos. Um, uh, we're just sharing right now. Um, my kids are playing in the background. Um, we are um, going to try and experiment along at home. So we are pre-posting uh, for people to join us on Facebook Live and we're telling them to go ahead and gather the supplies early and then we're having one of our graduate students um, go ahead and lead uh, people in an experiment that they can do at home. So we're planning um, several of those and the first ones make your own gravity simulator that we're going to do on Monday. Great. Thanks, Shannon. Um, I, I will ask um, if you raise your hands, um, digitally raise your hands, um, I can um, select you. So we have a little bit of order um, since some sharing is now was being done over Shannon. Um, just to keep a little bit of order, that would be great. Um, thank you. No, Sh Shannon, you were fine. Um, I didn't make that clear. 
So, um, Eric, since you're already streaming, you want to talk about what you have up? Um, I'm just playing around a little bit to find out how streaming works. I cannot see what I'm streaming myself, but this is a lunar eclipse. Yeah, we see the lunar eclipse. Um, great. Carissa, uh, you have your hand up if you want to go ahead. Hi, yes. Um, I just want to share that uh, the Carnegie Science Center in Pittsburgh right now, um, we're doing daily uh, releases um, every day, every morning we're releasing some, uh, we're calling it our three things. So every morning we give someone something to read, something to watch and something to do. So there's usually a, a book or an article that we're, that we're putting out and then a video. So actually this morning I just did um, a story time. So I read a book about Margaret Hamilton, a kid's book about Margaret Hamilton. And then we usually put out um, like a little science experiment that people can do with their families. So every day there's three different things that we're kind of sharing to our audiences. And we're trying to keep that pretty consistent like every day at eight o'clock in the morning. Great. And that consistency I'm sure really helps too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in the chat, um, See, Katie says that she's making videos for the Lake Erie Nature and Science Center with hands-on demos along with other coworkers about many different topics. And the first video was a lemonade activity recorded in the kitchen, which sounds like a lot of fun. Um, and I'm re reading that because the people who are watching on YouTube cannot see the chat. So also for those of you who have posted any links at all in the chat today, um, just a reminder, please post them in the Dome Dialogues group so that everybody watching on YouTube has access to those chat or those uh, links and information as well. Uh, Paulette. Um, so I just want to mention that I uh, posted a list of the resources that I've been using. So Stellarium, Worldwide Telescope, Open Space, OBS, NASA Eyes, Zoom, all of that on the, the Dome Dialogues uh, e-conference number two. Um, so if you're looking for any of those resources or the websites to get to the, the software, definitely check it out there. That's great, thanks Paulette. Uh, Horizons Unlimited in Salisbury, North Carolina is posting animal visits, experiments, and star talks on their Facebook page and a magazine uh, form called Flip Snack. Um, Neil, if you're able to um, speak a little bit on that, I'd like to know what Flip Snack is. Sure. Um, <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm Neil Pfeiffer I, um, in Salisbury. Uh, we use Flip Snack because uh, we are one to one district. So we can actually, uh, uh, we have to do a little bit. Uh, I guess I can share my screen and I'll go to Flip Snack. Let me, uh, let me bring it up. It's um, here. Um, choo -choo. I'll just share my screen. There we go. Choo. And you get to see the whole thing. So uh, basically this is a PDF viewer. What we find with our one-to-one -one district is that YouTube is blocked on all student devices. So we have to do host our videos in other places. So they can't go to Facebook, they can't go to YouTube. So what we do is we upload our videos to our LMS, which is Canvas in our case, but you can put it in Google Drive or something like that. And then uh, with your PDF file, use uh, QR codes to host your videos. And that is a much uh, cleaner way. Like even kids that just have a scan device or a phone, they can use the QR code to then get to that hosted video uh, because a lot of parents don't want kids understandably on YouTube or Facebook. So especially for your K2 uh, groups, this is a good, uh, and so we're actually producing a magazine kind of format where kids can just flip through and look at our videos. Thanks. That's awesome. Thanks, Neil. Um, Cara Musical. Hi there. I'm Cara um, from the Novens Planetarium in New Jersey. And we are posting Saturday short mini star talks. And we're also going to be doing some hands on crafts. I think my first one is Oreo moon phases with the kids this Friday. And so we'll be doing kind of 
two or three videos weekly and then sharing all the rest of the great content that y'all are putting out there. Try unmuting myself. A um, couple that are in the chat right now, um, just a little bit of disappointment not being able to present it. Um, it looks like mostly academic institutions, um, schools and colleges who are focusing on getting everything online for the students for the regular classes. And so the planetariums are unfortunately, it seems like on a back burner. Um, so maybe uh, for those of you who are in that situation where you're just waiting to see if you could post a video or if you're gonna be able to do any outreach, uh, maybe talk about what you're doing in the meantime. I see Patty says that you're just making lists of tasks to complete to stay sane. I hear that. <laughs> All right, well, if there's not any more um, discussion about uh, live streaming or anything like that, Oh, um, Carol also wanted to add that anyone feeling fr uh, free to share resources uh, that they put theirs out. Um, sorry, let me read this just how she wrote it. Anyone feel free to share resources we put out with your audiences if they seem helpful. Um, and uh, Amy Gallagher is saying that um, she created a list of websites and posted it to the Planetarium page and once a day to their Facebook. Um, so for those of you who do have access to your Facebook accounts, uh, I'm very jealous you're lucky. And um, that's that's another great avenue, of course, for the students who can reach it. Um, and at this point, I'm not seeing any more about streaming. So um, if we just wanna open it up to um, general talk, although first I'm seeing Michael is raising his hand. Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, so as we get into the open forum, I uh, just wanna remind everybody of the next two e-conferences. Uh, it's Wednesday and Friday of next week. So April 1st, April 3rd, both at noon. And so that's, we're gonna try to keep that pretty consistently. Uh, there will occasionally be some earlier times for international. We will try to have a little later times for our West Coast, uh, but 12 noon, uh, which is about, eh, it's 12. 1600 UTC um, for those of us overseas. Uh, just keep that in mind next week, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, we'll, we already have a, a number of presenters in line for both of them. Uh, so really excited about that. And of course, if you want to participate and you want to give a presentation, just let me know. We'll be happy to, to find you a slot. Um, and just to add on to that, again, if you really want to present and you're not comfortable presenting in English, there's nothing wrong with that. That's totally fine. One of the beautiful things about Zoom, I understand, is that we can have breakout sessions. We can have focus sessions in other languages. So if there is an interest, um, I've seen several um, German planetarians today. I know there's been several um, Italian planetarians that have been very active, um, Portuguese speaking planetarians. Um, I know some of the French planetarians have written on Dome Dialogues itself. If any of you want to do a specific language forum, we would love to set that up. So please let us know, um, message Michael, um, I can, uh, speak German and French, and I can somewhat understand Italian um, and can respond with the help of a dictionary. So um, you can send those to me in your native language if you like. I'm sorry that those are the only ones that I can handle, but uh, aside from that, yeah. All right, well, I guess we're into the open forum now, so. Do we have any updates from IPS maybe? Um, if our current past or future president would like to speak at all about anything? I don't know if Sean and Mark are still on, but we are still, there's no updates about when the postponement date will be for the uh, IPS. That's still the direction that Edmonton would like to go. 
but we are keeping in mind that um, 2021 was already a WAC SEPA MAPS conference in June. So we're considering all of those options as well. Thank you, Patty. Um, I'm sure, especially those of us who are already planning to go to IPS appreciate that. Does anybody else have any updates maybe from their regional organizations, not just your, your personal ones, but your um, professional development organizations? Um, I'll share just uh, briefly from, from GLIPA, if that's okay, Anna. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I think that this will be a, a topic in an upcoming uh, presentation. So just very briefly, um, I, I'm, Part of GLIPA conference planning, uh, and I met with the host for GLIPA 2020, and um, we are, I'm very, they're doing wonderful, Mark Reed and Steve Crawford are hosting at Kalamazoo Valley Museum uh, in October of 2020, and uh, plans are well on the way, and we'll be sharing more about that in an upcoming uh, e-conference. Great, thanks Renee. Um, Keeping the effort going to uh, stay punctual. We're almost at the end of our time, but in the last minute, if anybody has any other uh, burning question or announcement to make, um, please feel free. At the very least, uh, a huge thank you to Anna for hosting and moderating in my stead today. So thanks very, very much. No problem. And uh, if that is everything, I think on behalf of Anna and uh, the team at Dope Dialogues, thank you all for coming out to e-conference number two. Uh, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow night. And if not, we see you next week for conference number three. Take care. Peace. Bye.